So here we go, another episode from Tales from the Real World, but this time we're going to be talking from someone who's very involved in the community and has been involved in a lot of cloud work in the past as well. So stay tuned for this episode today of Cloud with Chris. Hello there and welcome back to another episode of Cloud with Chris. You're with me, Chris Reddington, and here we talk about all things cloud. Now, thank you for joining here today. As we mentioned in the quick intro there, we are doing another of the Tales from the Real World episodes. They've uh, been a hit with people so far, so we're carrying on that trend here. So you know what to do. If you like this episode, please hit the like button, please subscribe to the channel, and please hit the notification bell. And of course, as we mentioned about the subscribers, Thank you so much. We've uh, hit 500 subscribers recently. It's greatly appreciated. And now we're on a journey to continue that growth as well. So again, if you enjoy that content, please go and tell others about it as well. Share on uh, because it really does help uh, keep the momentum of the channel growing and more and more content coming out as well. So with that all done and out of the way, let's go ahead and introduce this episode today. So Tales from the Real World, this time with Matt Bradley. So we're going to be introducing Matt in a moment, but Matt, I first met in uh, one of our user groups, Raj Thames Valley, did a brilliant session with uh, a session called the Storage Minefield. And I think uh, there are going to be some great insights from Matt today. So without further ado, let's go ahead, switch screens and bring Matt into the discussion here. And good afternoon, Matt. How are we doing, sir? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Chris. How are you? Doing yeah, today? all good. Thank you. All good. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate you coming on. That's okay. Congrats on your 500 views <laughs> as well. I saw, I saw that on Twitter like, the week before last, maybe. Um, and didn't you say you, at the start of the year you've had about 100, 150? Yeah. And then you, you set yourself a target for, for this whole year to get to 500. That's and we're it. in May. Uh, when you, you smashed it so yeah <laughs> thank you no, i count it's... as one person towards those subscribers so. <laughs> and every person counts right i'm gonna try and not, yeah. not step on any uh, trademark infringements there but every person helps <laughs> um we'll go there um but no it's uh it's been a journey and i kind of have to pinch myself every to every so often thinking you know that's what, five months now? We're just uh, coming to the end of May here and uh, got 400 subscribers. So who knows? Maybe we'll get 1,000 by the end of the year and that'll be great. And if not, that's still great because target's been hit and more and more great content will be coming out. So it's all good. Yeah. So anyway, enough about uh, the channel and subscribers and whatnot. <laughs> Today we're talking with you. So let's, um, let's maybe start with some introductions, Matt, about yourself and uh, go from there. Yeah, sure. So it's just on. So give me one second. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, oh, so good. yeah, so yeah, I'm uh, like so Chris. I'm managed by Bradley. Um, we first met um, at your the user group that you co-host, the Azure yep. Things Valley user group. Um, which the first time I attended that was was me there presenting at the user group. So I think I reached out over the meetup application, yep. I think, and just asked if you were interested in speakers. Um, and then you were kind enough to let me let me join you for, for doing the stop talk on Azure Storage. Um, and then we've obviously kept in touch since. Um, there's a few attendees there that I met there for the first time and we still speak to. So it was a really, really friendly user group that you got down there. Um, and, you know, we said at the start of this conversation that lockdown's been like pretty rubbish, hasn't it really? But yep. there have been some positives like user groups being remote, being able to attend user groups that you might not have been able to get to geographically. Um, you know, I did one, I attended one in um, in America that nice. I nearly certainly wouldn't have flown over for <laughs> in the normal <laughs> circumstances. Um, so that, yeah, that was great. So um, you know, obviously we've kept in touch since then. Um, in terms of what I do though, so I've worked in the Azure environments for about four years now. Mm -hmm. So I've been at a company called UK Fast for about 10 years um, and did a lot of um, application windows level support um, within their data centers and then moved over to the Azure side probably about three years ago now, I think, maybe a little bit longer mm. um, to start the, the Azure division that they started to do to embrace embrace the wonderful public cloud. Um, so, yeah, I kind of deal with many various things, really. Um, I do a little bit of DevOps. Um, I do some consultancy migration support. 
um, and just general whatever I needed to do really to whatever the customers need, I'll, gotcha. I'll jump in with and uh, try and help them out with it. So it's just a fascinating world to be involved with, isn't it? Really, so it's something new every day. Absolutely, you don't get anywhere else. <laughs> Absolutely, or, you know, outside the public cloud at least. Yeah, um, it's not as your, but you know, it's um, yeah, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a great new world to be involved with. Awesome, and no, I think you're spot on there. Like one of the common questions I get from people is, you know, how do you keep up with everything? How do you keep learning? Expecting me to give some mad, <clears throat> excuse me, some magic answer of, you know, there's some great tool or knowledge base or something out there, and it is just a case of, you know, yeah. keeping on top of the blog post, keeping on top of the updates, yeah. and just keeping hands on and keeping the sword sharp, right? And uh, just. Uh, keep on working with things and as you say there's always new things to learn and i think that's the thing about cloud is i i don't think anyone can be an expert of cloud right and Azure, mm -hmm. i think you've got your own expertise within these certain domain areas and uh, you've got that t-shape that a lot of people refer to you've got that broad uh, knowledge across yeah. a lot and then focusing on a certain area so no yeah. completely with you. Uh, yeah i think to keep up with um with these all world in full that the, the only the, the only realistic and truthful answer to that is you need to have no life and just keep reading <laughs> and look at everyone online. But there are some great resources to try and get into that and get that. So um, obviously the Azure blog post, the Microsoft blog post is great as a one pager, isn't it, to look at um, the recent updates. Um, yes. That's quite good. I've not looked at that for a while myself. Um, and you know, I mentioned quite a lot, but John Savile's videos are also great. He does a weekly infrastructure update on a Sunday. Uh, which covers all the recent updates from the week before. So that's kind of condensed into, it varies depending on the updates, but maybe 15 to 30 minutes for John Tabber's videos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the blog page you have on your screen there, Chris, that's that's a really great source of information for Microsoft. Um, it's just got a good, nice layout. It's, you, know, you can just you can skim over things quite until you see what you want. Yeah. Um, and the, 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 the bigger updates will tend to be at the top in that little gray area. You know, below the black, we can see they tend to keep the, the more important ones up there, don't they, from experience. Um, they kind of get pinned to the top um, or what they deem as being more important, I guess. But Yeah, and I think the other one, to... the other one that I cover in my weekly updates as well, and I think is a bit of a, not obscure, but one of those uh, jewels or diamonds that people don't necessarily realise is there is um, this Azure Updates page as well. And this is... I guess the blog post, as you say, is more of these bigger updates where uh, people want to, or the product teams want to go and shout out about something happening. Whereas then uh, the Azure updates may be kind of tweaks to additional services, you know, new regions of, of original services. They're already there, for example, these kind of things. So, you know, there's uh, plenty of stuff in there to, to keep up to date with. Uh, and that's just how I keep tabs on what's going on, to be honest. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you can see there the RSS feed as well. So straight to your inbox or uh, whatever communication channels you use, Teams, Slack, whatever. Absolutely. Um, and one particularly good one there just stood out to me, which was the GA of um, VNet Peering for the Joe Bastion. Mm. Yes. That's, there that's is, a good, yeah. That's, yeah. I never really put too much thought into that before as a, um, as a Bastion device because, mm -hmm. because of that limitation. If you've got, you got a really simple network, it's, it's, it's great. But if you have any hub and spoke set up, uh, it wasn't always very, very feasible without that peering capability. Yeah. So, yeah, that 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 made me happy. And that has some really good uh, benefits along with that as well. You know, management for a start is now easier, I guess, from that perspective. And yeah. then cost, of course, as well comes down because you no longer need a bastion uh, per VNet, right? At that point, you can mm -hmm. start peering, have that management. Uh, excuse me, management spoke or management hub, if you like, and then have your different spokes that you need to go and communicate with. Then, so it's. Um, yeah, enables enables quite a bit there. And I think that's the thing about this Azure Updates page is sometimes people keep focused on the Azure blog itself, you know, for the big announcements, but actually there's things like this that sometimes creep under the radar that people don't quite realise because they're not quite tracking this one. So I can't recommend this page enough either. Yeah. Yeah. And there's your Bastion side as well. With the, we can obviously they're so quick to create as well. So you can what we do quite a lot is script the creation of your bastion so that mm -hmm. you only kind of create it when you need it because it's there within a couple of minutes so yeah. if you've got business critical workloads that if there's an issue you need to go there straight away that's not the obviously the use case for it 
or you can script the creation of these things, use it, and then script the deletion, you know, to automate the deletion an hour later, maybe. Mm-hmm. So even though it's a low cost, you can make it even lower. Yep. Um, but like a, more of like a just-in-time access yeah. um, to spin off. So. And that's the brilliant yeah. promise of infrastructure as code, isn't it? You know, being able to go and uh, yeah. spin things up in a desired state on demand. Uh, don't get yeah. me started on that. I'm a big, big fan of infrastructure as code, etc. <laughs> yeah, I mix with that with the pay-to-go model. Um, yeah. Yeah, you've, you've got a good combination there, haven't you, for keeping costs as low as you can do. Absolutely. Oh, good stuff. So I guess then, um, you know, the series that we're doing this episode as a part of is Tales from the Real World, where we kind of bring people on, talk through some of their experiences, where they've been involved in projects and, you know, various implementations with cloud and Azure and all these things. So maybe let's start, you mentioned about, uh, you know, the past four years you've been involved with Azure and helping set up that public cloud division in uh, UK Fast. So... Mm-hmm. What are maybe some of the moments and some of the pieces along the way that stand out for you that might be worth talking about, let's say, and uh, we can hone in on some of those? Yeah, I think there was there was a lot of things that kind of happened on the way there because when we started the Azure division, mm. um, it was complete new tooling that we're using, not just the Azure side of things, but all the systems we used internally to manage the, the application in Azure. Sure. So, that was obviously a really steep learning curve and you know, testing different applications and software and things, but also probably on that area probably isn't very interesting that people listen to this might want to know about because it's not as your specific. But that was certainly, that was a challenge along the way, right? Trying sure. to get the right tools for the job. Um, I think adopting a, um, a, a, de- a good DevOps um, kind of framework and methodology for doing deployments is definitely one of them. Um, you know, you, you, you mentioned before what I see, um, you, you're a big fan of using that. I think really, if you're using public cloud and you're not using IAC, then you, you're doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to say you, you, know, you don't have to use it yet. You can spin things up and if you've got things that won't ever change, fine. But it, it's not, the, right, it's not the, the, the best way it might be to do things. Yeah. Um, you know, having, the, having everything scripted and redeployable, you know, Apple versus Pets mentality and all that. Um, uh, having that done in the right way, that can be very tricky to get right to try and streamline. Um, because everything you try and do using IAC, you're obviously trying to take away um, a lot of that time and effort that it is takes to scale things. You know, it's repeatable patterns, repeatable workloads. Yeah. You're trying to get done there and trying to take all that all the manual tasks that could take you many many hours to do, even for something as simple as you know onboarding of a customer. Like if you anything you do manually, you can script. Mm-hmm. Right, because all you're doing is clicking as your or clicking whatever else, and all that's doing is calling an API. So whatever you do manually, you can script, and trying to get that process just refined and uh, streamlined, I think, is, is that was a really interesting journey to go on. Nice. Um, so we went down the route with uh, Azure DevOps mm-hmm. um, for most of the tooling because where where I work is a tier one CSP, so we get a lot of internal use rights for licenses. Yep. Um, with things like DevOps competencies, so we're a gold partner. In, we have the gold DevOps competency, sure. um, and so you get like 100 and something user rights for um, MSDN, mm-hmm. which gives you then use your DevOps licenses as part of that. To go in there and also as your credit. So, sure. um, obviously there are. I don't say there are. I thought there were better tools out there, but obviously the, the, the benefit you have with your DevOps is it's not just a CI/CD pipeline tool. It's the most things you have in the DevOps world will be a repo. You might have GitHub or GitLab. Mm-hmm. You might have a CI CD pipeline tool. You might have something separate for your project management, for your boards, like, like there are other companies out there that do similar things. Um, so it, it's really nice to have all that together, I think. Mm-hmm. Now, there are, I think there probably are better companies. The companies that might do it a little bit better individually. Yes. But the benefit of having it all together in one place, you don't always need all the bells and whistles that come with these other companies that focus just on that one area. Yep. Um, so, you know, having all those um, all those um, ideas together and the fact that we get the internal use rights made sense to go down these your DevOps routes um, as a tool to, to do it all because the license cost would have been, you know, for, for what we get as your <laughs> DevOps for, 100 yeah. licenses on MSDL or 200 licenses because we get them for other things as well. Um, and so, yeah, if you, paid, if you did that in any other tool or many tools to do the same job, it would be thousands of pounds. Absolutely. To do that. So, you know, it, it makes sense. 
And obviously, Azure DevOps is a Microsoft product, so therefore, it's natively going to be a lot communicate a lot better with your portal. Um, you know, you might get Microsoft developing the um, the extensions that are used with Azure DevOps. So you've got their product teams trying to make this better. You know, the people who make what you're connecting into, they're trying to make this better to integrate. So um, you know, you can't, you literally cannot get a better team of people to be working on on that platform for you. Um, so yeah, that was definitely a an interesting journey. Nice. And going up between all those, and yeah, the just trying to get the process streamlined, refined. Obviously, there's always the argument, not not argument, but um, you know the what is an argument sometimes between on templates, Terraform, you know, now you've got as your bicep as well, Microsoft bicep as well. Yep. Um, so you know we we do a mix of both, but a lot of our stuff is, is primarily ARM at the moment. Um, no reason really. I think we started to do ARM over Terraform because when I started to do that, ARM's what I learned first, and we started to do that. And it's you know, it's it's you get updates to ARM before you get the Terraform, so new modules will be there first. On the AWS world, it, that's not a swear word. The, uh, <laughs> not at the all. It's it's cloud so, with Chris, right? So uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but obviously, the rest works in a different way. So their mm. native um, IAC, so their, their cloud formation, gets yes. updates after Terraform does. So there's a, obviously on, on that side, it makes sense. They get modules developed for Terraform or updates for Terraform, mm. and cloud formation comes afterwards. Um, obviously, in this your world, it's it's the other way around. around. Yeah, that's so. Um, I know Microsoft are working closely though with Azure Corp as well to yep. um, to shorten that time. Um, I heard this the first time a year or two ago, maybe because it was at a meetup group in person. Mm. Um, so wow. it to <laughs> yeah, with real people, uh, and they were. Tr- I think they said it was around a twelve week turnaround at the time between uh, roughly or on average between ARM and Terraform getting the, the compatibility together, and they were trying to reduce that to, to three or four weeks. I think yeah. was the, the the current target at the, or the, the target at the time. Um, you know, three four weeks isn't isn't as bad, but if you wait in three months, then yeah. that's sometimes a bit long to wait for a new feature or a limitation to be in place when you can't get a new feature yep. without you know ripping apart code and maybe using some PowerShell in there as well, and um, it can add a, a bit of complexity to the to the deployment plans as well. Absolutely, no spot on, and I think there are a few interesting things that you mentioned in there, like um, the, the different DevOps tooling. Taking back to that piece for a minute i think um there was a term i used to call this kind of frankenstein devops tooling i think is how i used to call it where you you know bringing loads of pieces together and it absolutely works right because i think that is the point is that a lot of these different platforms as you say did one thing and they did one thing super super well but you know mm-hmm. they need to bring in a jenkins or a jira or a bitbucket or a whatever it may be and then you have this frankensteinian kind of setup of uh, yeah. of a devops platform and i think you're right you know azure devops is this great platform that actually you look left to right you've got the boards you've got the repos you've got the pipelines you've got the artifacts and you can do it all in one um and potentially save on cost as well so it's absolutely right and yeah, I'm with you on the whole infrastructure as code side of things. I've dabbled in all of the above. So yeah. ARM templates, Terraform, uh, Bicep, of course, recently as well. And <clears throat> I don't think there's necessarily a, you know, thou shalt go down and use this uh, this approach, right? They're, they're all great for different reasons. And, mm. uh, you know, I know ARM templates, of course, and it has been typically quite difficult for people to pick up and author because of you know using json and then the kind of language inside and the domain specific way that it works but mm-hmm. i think now with what's coming with bicep it when you look at it there's a lot of similarities to something like terraform and the way it's yeah. set up and the kind of language styling and whatnot but i think for me one of the things about terraform that has been and it's not a blocker it's just one of those challenges that you then have as an overhead is because arm or by separate service you know they they really are talking to azure resource manager because azure resource manager is the service or the platform right and yeah. templates happen to be in front of that um 
Terraform is more of this framework, isn't it? And you can go and use it with AWS or GCP or yeah. um, Kubernetes or whatever it may be, right? So uh, you've got these different providers. And because of that great flexibility, it means there's trade-offs and you've got to go and manage the state of things yourself somewhere. And that's where complexity comes in. And it's not impossible, yeah. but it it's just additional complexity. And it's always the, what are we gaining for what we're putting in here? And is it worth that return then so yeah. there's always uh options there people always call it when they say well it technically it is you know, hdl is cloud agnostic yeah but it's not you know people often make the assumption that means that template that works in one environment works in another which is just doesn't that's not how it works no. it's if you're training your staff internally to work on both platforms then that that barrier to entry for them to be able to support that yeah. or to work on that is lower it's the, it's the common language, isn't it? It's not exactly. It's not, I'm not, it's the templates aren't agnostic. It's a language which is agnostic. Exactly, exactly um, that. But what you said before around it's weird, isn't it? So you know, there's your DevOps tooling where you, know, you call it kind of the, the Frankenstein of tools together, where you put all these <laughs> things all over the place. It's weird how things work in like different ways because if you think about when you look about applications and infrastructure over the past five, ten years, mm. people try to do the opposite to that. They've gone from monoliths and tried to split onto microservice and thought, yeah, you, you want this to be all these separate pieces because you do one thing and do it well, yep. which is exactly what you said to these other people who do that do the individual components. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then Microsoft's using this tool where they go the other way and put it all together. And I quite like that. Uh, but then it's the same with the pay as you go model where if you think about a phone contract, like you wouldn't have pay as you go on your phone now. You want a phone contract to pay a fixed amount each month. Yep. Whereas in cloud, it's it, it benefits you to go back to that page go model. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of going back and forth between these different it is. and how people operate and how, how they work in the technology world. It is. I hadn't thought about the pay as you go model and with phones. I like that analogy. It's like um yeah. <laughs> it's like also the uh we're reinventing the wheel with technology, right? We had mainframes, we then went to kind of servers, then the client PC. Now we're going to cloud, which is kind of looking a bit like we're going back to that mainframe kind of idea again. It's yeah. it's really fascinating how it comes around in waves, doesn't it? And you see yeah. that in a lot of places. So awesome. Excellent. So I guess then, you know, DevOps has been a big part of that journey and uh, having those processes there. When you think about, I guess, and, you know, not disclosing any particular customers or anything here at all, but thinking about the types of projects that you've had come in over the past few years, are there certain uh, themes about the types of technologies, like are they more migration, lift and shift type things? Are they modernizing? What are you kind of seeing people are doing on their cloud journey? I guess let's maybe it's tap into that a bit. Yeah, so it's a, it's a bit of both of those things, to be honest. Mm. Um, so the company I work for has their own data centers. So sure. I naturally will speak to people who want to do a lift and shift from their data centers into Azure. Yep. And I think it depends on the type. It, it depends a lot on the different departments they have within the company. Mm. Uh, you know, how a kind of developer heavy are they? How DevOps heavy are they? What's their tech team sure. like? Um, and also what the size of the, the infrastructure is. You now, if you pick up an environment which is hundreds hundred virtual machines it doesn't make sense to to do that modernization if you're going to go to azure it doesn't make sense to go from vms modernize everything and stick it into azure mm -hmm. well i mean it, it might make sense it depends on how it works but a lot of the bigger companies don't do that straight away because you've got to redevelop it all before you do the full move unless you set up kind of some you know big network between them all uh, yep. set of vpns or express route maybe which you may well do um to allow things to exist on both sides um Commonly what we'll see for the kind of larger ones is people just want to first of all get their foot into Azure. Yep. So they'll migrate in. They might do, they might use ASR to get in there. They might spin up VMs from scratch. Obviously, it's always better to be clear, right? But it's a bit more work. Um just to have the the, the foot into Azure. And then once you've done that, you can then start to split off things and change things onto um, the platforms and service offerings. So um obviously I work in the Windows world primarily. Sure. predominantly rather than the windows world so a lot of my things that you know it, it's getting people onto app, uh, web apps manage yep. instances as your sql using some of the the data uh, data factory data warehouse and things like that um so i'm quite focused in that area kind of around the .NET sure. tools available um mssql i mean i do other things as well but that's that's where i get involved with more of a specialization gotcha. about the yeah, migrations so we see yeah, we, we definitely see a bit of both um we're we'll, obviously as a provider i'll always suggest that people don't take the vm route 
but it's not always feasible to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, virtual machines, uh, they are a great technology, but they're not a new technology. Right? They've been around for about, 15, I'm going to guess, 15 years. 15 that might years. be wrong. Yeah. Um, but you know, they were, VMs were designed to make better use of hardware. They were yes. designed for cloud. They were designed to not spend as much money on hardware. Um, it's when you get the real benefit when you start to make use of these cloud native technologies. Running VMs in cloud, um, you, you don't get the best use of it. You know, you, you're not gonna you're not gonna save much money. You're probably gonna spend more money by doing that. Um, if once you do things properly and add the bits around it, the framework you need for your landing zones and you know, mm-hmm. VPN connectivity, you probably pay more. Whereas the cloud native technologies, so things like web apps, things like Azure SQL, managed instances, um, because they are cloud native technologies, they've been designed for the clouds. So they, they natively will scale. They natively, yes. they will likely be cheaper because you pay for the compute costs. You don't pay for the overhead that Windows just chews into just to be online. Um, and, you know, you don't pay the same licensing costs as well that you think you have to pay for this. So um, that's where you say, that's where you can reduce the costs. Absolutely. Going off computer and onto platforms and service. Um, Stat modernization, um, kind of journey, I guess, because you never, you never truly get there. It's, it's, yeah. it's always a, a journey you continue on. Um, it, it's something that we, we do not push but we we steer down that <laughs> yeah say, it, it benefits us it benefits them <clears throat> they're on newer technology um you know there's there's less issues because they've got ha built in yep. a lot of time the backups and resilience is built in there's less things that can go wrong in that area um so they have a better time and we have a better time because of that as well absolutely and i think there's numerous other things right like with the cost side of things you know, you're paying for a virtual machine if you're going down the VM route. But, you know, if you're using something like App Service or SQL DB or something similar, that's a multi tenant platform. And I think that's yeah. where those cost benefits start coming in because you're not the only customer who's paying towards that underlying deployment stamp. You know, there's many customers that are going to be paying and going towards covering those underlying costs and that's where as you say you get some of those cost efficiencies and savings and i think if you are a dev shop or something similar you can then start freeing yourself up from some of that management overhead which let's face it some of us are probably not so interested in in wanting to keep the lights on right we want to do the new shiny technology things and be able to build some new stuff and uh, do some innovation and i think that's where then when you start doing that modernization with things like PaaS, platform as a service, or even going along to some of the servers, serverless platforms as well, mm-hmm. like Azure Functions, Logic Apps, um, that's where then you can start freeing up some of that time and doing some really cool innovative stuff like bringing machine learning and AI and all these kind of buzzwords that we all probably hear that translate into great uh, technology features that then get into the applications and then you know obviously goes back into the circle impacting the business and business then wants the new shiny technology features and it <laughs> then then changes the discussion doesn't it i think and that's uh, that's certainly the journey i've seen a lot of people go on at least is as you say that lift and shift modernize now we're really going to start innovating uh, i would say yeah. almost that three step yeah, yeah, because a lot of time as well, some of the platform as a service tools aren't that different to the end users than what the what young virtual machines. So if you think about kind of if you yep. before you I had like Azure SQL or web apps, when you thought about moving off VMs, it, it truly was serverless. So it was either well, it's, it's not truly serverless, is it really? This this is server, but it was things like functions or containers. You know, it was something kind of completely different with how you do deployments, how you manage things. Whereas web apps, you know, that it's just an IS back end. You know, the only difference is you FTP your, your data there, which or you know, you stick in a pipeline which will FTP it in, which you may have done before anyway. The fact that you can't log on to that server makes yep. no difference. It's it's a familiar process, it's a familiar technology, familiar platform. And as your SQL as well, you know, maybe more so managed instance, but the fact you can't log on to the VM makes no difference because using SQL as an example, if you log on to a VM that was running SQL that you were paying for. You'd open Manager Studio if you were going to work directly on there, or you would open it from your remote machine, connect in. That OS doesn't mean that means nothing to you as a user because nope. it's only the tools on there that you need to use to access the data. So why should you, you shouldn't have to pay the OS? Um and, you know, I think as well around the cost elements, what you said before was absolutely right around um, you know, they you know you, obviously the virtual machines are also on a like a shared host, but it's it's you can get more people on there on the platform as a service, but yeah. You see the differences between other cloud providers and the costs they charge for these kind of platforms. And, you know, Microsoft have been charging licenses and they want you on these platforms of service offerings, right? So things like web apps, things like SQL, 
you won't get them cheaper anywhere else because Microsoft can control license costs and they want you on their platform. So you'll, you'll always save money there for that reason as well as the need that you described. Um, when you look at platforms and service on other providers, you'll generally pay for the compute and the management wrapper around it. Yep. With, with a lot of things, that's very common to have. Whereas on these your sides, it's often less than what the compute cost will be. Gotcha. Um, obviously, with that, you do get all the benefits. You get the HA, you get everything else built in. It's all nice. You, like you said, you, you don't you don't care about keeping lights turned on. Like I, I really enjoy the fact that working as your, if there's a failure in the data center, I well, I, I probably will get called. But I don't have to go down <laughs> to the data center. I don't have to fix the issue. You know, yeah. it's someone else. Yeah, yeah. I wait for someone else to fix it and then just do my work afterwards. Um, and that yeah, that, that's that's really nice to. Yeah. To have, and you know, you know, you don't need to to run down to any data centers to fix any physical service, replace any switches. Um, you just let someone else do that for you, and that's that's worth it. That's worth it. The, the, the pay for it to, <laughs> to offset that uh, that that all that work. Absolutely, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? The further you move along that uh, abstraction, you know, from on-prem IaaS, PaaS to SaaS, you're taking away a lot of that management overhead that either mm-hmm. you as a service provider or the end customer actually needs to go and manage and i think that's in everyone's benefit and interest as we mentioned earlier the the more you can go to the right of that spectrum the more you can go focus on innovation and actually adding value to the business and to the end users rather than just keeping the lights on it can only be a good thing yeah i often just think it was like it's it's like moving from being the wholesaler to being a retailer down the mm. chain uh, especially being in the past where i've been data center uh, working in data centers uh, or supporting things in there is the yeah, the shifting responsibility is is really nice to have I think as as a both as an engineer as a techie as a customer is really nice to have um, and the, the benefit you get with this as well as just that you know, the management of the cost is one thing but if you say if you were going if you were a customer and you're going through some kind of uh, say ISO accreditation mm-hmm. and you need to get your ISO forms filled in. A lot of people will go to public cloud just to say the documentation for this is on this website, download, tick a box, done, because that takes months to go through. Yep. Moving into these environments, you automatically get the infrastructure level documentation. It's all done. Give that to your ISO auditor, and it's great. You just do your application yeah. level, the internal stuff, um, to say you do things properly. But having those compliance documents and those standards that are hit um, – helps them win business, helps yep. them pass their audits. And so it's not even just the cost and management of it. Although that, I guess, overflows onto that is you don't need to manage that anymore or pay to go through that process. It's you sign up for a subscription and you've got, you've got, you've got the ISO for the infrastructure level. Yeah. And it's funny, like what you mentioned there about the uh, compliance. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever mentioned this on the channel before, but I've had conversations in the past with uh, CIOs and CTOs where they've been, uh, you know, moving towards the clouds and they were planning, like a lot of people do initially, going a hybrid model, thinking, right, we'll keep some on prem, we'll keep managing that, and we'll uh, gradually phase across into the cloud. And I've had numerous scenarios where uh, they've actually came back to us and said, that was the plan but we're just going to go straight to cloud because we've actually spoken with our either security or a compliance team or whoever it may be. And actually the benefit of moving to cloud from a compliance perspective, we just cannot even begin to match what yeah. is possible in the cloud. And so they just yeah. take that step, like you say, because of that check mark there. Yeah. Although one thing just kind of bearing off slightly back in the way of <clears throat> on-prem, mm. um, one thing that helps with that massively as well Um is or and probably will get better in future is is your arc um, yes. to manage those yes. on-prem devices because you can start then to apply obviously it doesn't really affect the infrastructure because that's going to be on-prem but in terms of the um the internal compliance and governance so ha- being able to pass through as your policy to your on-prem vms now it's i'm pretty sure still at the moment it, it's order only so you can't actually remediate things i sure. think that's what i'm pretty sure that's where it's up to still um but that will change you know agent based yep deployments that will change um, but just been able to say from these reports that all those policies are being complied with is also great for those kind of audits and, and um, yeah, reviews as well yeah um, absolutely so that, that's a great tool I think there's a few things in Azure that will come out because things come out all the time right every week every day there's either updates to a platform <laughs> or there's new products coming out and it's not off, it's like sometimes you look at things you're like that's pretty good um, sometimes you look at things you're like holy 
moly, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and, you know, for me, as your arc was one of those things. Yes. Um, maybe because well, you know, we have data centers as well, maybe. Um, but I think having that where you can manage things, not only on-prem, but in Azure, in AWS, GCP, from that central location in Azure, um, it's great. And obviously Kubernetes as well, you can do that currently from Azure also with on-prem. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, Azure Arc, manage instance we talked about before, but those two in Azure Arc are my kind of like, wow, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, good. that's and, good. And I think that's the thing, isn't it, is what you're getting with some of those technologies you mentioned there is all of the effort and the love and the investment that Microsoft has been putting into uh, public cloud, you know, with ARM, for example, the management plane, with yeah. uh, Azure policy and being able to manage uh, resources at scale. Now taking that back to the on-premises world so you can have that consistent management plane, management approach, be able to go and have that hybrid model, I think is a really interesting approach and is really innovative, isn't it? And um, yeah, I think a lot of people don't appreciate enough actually what that power actually is. Uh, it is quite yeah. exciting. Yeah, because you can, I, I, it was only quite recently I started to look at the all the hybrid tools you can use. Yeah. Um, and you can, you can build as your resources using Windows Admin Center on a VM on-prem. You can, yes. You, yeah. can, you can create resources in as your using Windows Admin Center on-prem. And I saw, I was like, how did I not know you could do this? Yep. And that, that's great. And you don't need, to, I mean, obviously, we don't do that as a company because we do things <laughs> in a different way, but to have the ability to do this, whether it's just for development or you just want to try a server in as your, mm. and that's probably why Microsoft have done this, right? Just to let people dip their toes in. Um, that's just amazing. And been able to span your network from on prem to Azure as well, which you can now do. Yep. Um, and you know, all the SCCM integration as well. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool stuff that I just wasn't aware of until quite recently. Yeah. That you can do with this. Um there's some really good sources of info on this. Um so Sarah Lean does a lot of work um in her blogs and videos um around hybrids. She did a talk at your user group. She did quite recently. She did on that exact topic. Um and uh, Thomas Mara as well has got some great um, resources that he, he puts online around the hybrid setup as well. I'm just bringing up Sarah's uh, YouTube page here as well. There we go. Ah, so, there she is. There she is. Um, so, yeah, Sarah is actually going to be coming on the show in a few weeks. And we had Thomas on last year talking about uh, hybrid as well. So for anyone interested yeah. in the discussion, you know, obviously check Sarah's out when uh, Sarah's comes out, I I think it's a few weeks time and uh thomas is from last year as well because uh yeah we've talked and touched upon a lot of those themes there from uh, uh the hybrid side of things actually so yeah. if you look at those top few videos there as well if there's somewhere you want to spend lockdown in it's the scottish highlands <laughs> it absolutely how great is. does that look on those videos it does i am slightly jealous i think that's my goal of getting to a thousand subscribers because i got a nice uh, country park kind of thing about a 15 minute walk away from my house where i am yeah and uh, being able to do something like that just walking around i think is a good incentive so yeah uh, you know that's uh, that's a good reason to get to that level excellent so i guess then uh, thinking of starting to wrap us up and uh, bring bring the session to a close here uh i guess you mentioned a few areas where you know it was like quite an exciting moment of uh, technology and cloud and whatnot what kind of things are you keeping up to date with and learning at the minute there matt what's uh on the learning list for you oh god have i got so my my learning list in terms of you know exams or learning for that kind of reason um it's not actually as your my next one. So my next one is Microsoft 365 Security Administration. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because the company needs it for a competency, and so just doing that. Um, but other than that, I've recently had this, which I don't know if you can see it. Ah, uh, nice. T SQL fundamentals. Yes. Yeah. yeah. See it nice side behind it, I'll show you. Um, as you can imagine, it's quite a dry book, but there's a lot <laughs> of good resource in there. Yeah. Um, and the other one, which I don't have around my desk at the moment, um, but is the Kubernetes book from Nigel Poulton. I, I did see on Twitter. So, I thought you might mention that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've, got, I've got the Kubernetes book, which is the bigger one, and also from Nigel as well, um, the Quick Start Guide, which yeah. is a it, – it, it's obviously it's a shorter one um, about getting to learn the basics, and um, it's like a, a, a walk through, a hands-on 
he shows you how to do things. So you're not only reading about it, mm -hmm. you're going through um, and doing it yourself. Awesome. Um, so that's that's not as your, that's just Kubernetes. So you, on your local machine, yep. um, using the containers on there with the Docker application. Uh, and, the, and the Kubernetes book um, will be after that. So they're the main things really to learn at the moment. But I think Excellent. in between that, the hybrid stuff, I need to learn more about as well. Because yeah. that, that, that just fascinates me how you can have the integration between those those worlds together. Gotcha. No, awesome. And I did see the, as I say, the book on uh, Twitter from Nigel. And Nigel's put some great content out there. I think um, when I was learning containers, et cetera, a good few years ago now, he had some great courses on plural sites. So if anyone has plural yeah. sites access, definitely check those out. I haven't seen his Kubernetes book, so I might have to check that one out because I'm sure I'm coming up to renewal time for my certified Kubernetes exams. Actually, I need to check those ones out. So, uh, <laughs> which, which one is it the associate or the developer? Uh, so I did, but I did both. I did the CKA okay. and the CKAD and they're both great exams, um, hands on and, uh, tough in the sense that you have obviously a time limit and, uh, they're all very practical. You know, it's not a case of multiple choice Q and a type thing. It is go and solve this problem kind of scenario and get to this result. And, yeah. uh, you know, you either know it or you don't in those scenarios. You've got access yeah. to the docs, but you kind of got to know what you're looking for to solve the problem as well. So um, I like the way they do those exams, actually. But uh, yeah, the problem again, right. like Kubernetes is released, what, I think it was every three or four months. I think they've changed it recently, if I remember rightly. So again, content is always <laughs> updating as well. So uh, like cloud, things are always moving. Yeah, the... Um... Those type of exams are good, though, because the Linux ones typically work yes. in a similar way. The summer don't, but the, the Red Hat one, for example, or Cisco ones do as well. And yes. I think that's good. You get the, you, proper yeah, experience. There's the micro ones, micro ones are more about memory. And yeah, yeah, I think the hands on ones prove you know how to do something. Sometimes you can pass, you can have, you can pass an exam and you don't actually know fully how to do it. It doesn't prove you can do that job well. Exactly. It proves that you being able to Remember retain <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly yeah um yeah it's not just if you for the most of the exams if you know the configuration options and limitations of each platform you can pass i know that that, that that's makes it sound very simple that's that's a lot of information to, mm. to know about um but other than the labs it's only it's only very a small amount hands-on yeah it's, um, it's I almost think having that is good yeah, it's it's almost architectural, isn't it? Versus being the yeah. hands-on implementer, I think, is kind of comparing and contrasting. So, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I think with the Kubernetes exams, you know, I I definitely got a big sense of achievement. It felt like when you did it, because yeah. I think one of them, I can't remember which, but I did fail the first time, and it was literally by one mark. Like, you know, that sods law scenario that you don't want to have. It was one single mark, and you're thinking, where did I fall down? What could I have done? Because um, it's quite yeah. a high pass mark as well, actually, for that exam. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, as I say, a good sense of achievement when you get there. So good uh, good milestones to aim for. Um, on the Kubernetes book, mm. um, the reason why I got that one was because um, I think it was a new release, but there's there's a hardback edition release of it. Yeah. Um, if it wasn't new, someone said it wasn't, that was enough for me to buy it. So whoever that was <laughs> should be on commission if it's not the case. Um, there was also a Borg edition that was released. I don't know if you've seen that one. I've um, heard of it, based yeah. On, based on the Borg to Star Wars language, because obviously Borg was the original project name for Kubernetes went at Google. You might have offended um, some Trekkies there. Star Trek. Why? <laughs> Star Trek, not What's Star Wars. Like? Did I say Star Wars? <laughs> you did. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm a Star Wars fan, so I'm fine. I'll, I'll say Star Wars oh. all the time, but it's yes. all good. I'm yeah. sure uh, we'll have some people that's... calling that one out. <laughs> uh, that's to anyone watching Star Trek, I'm sorry, that, that's fighting talk, isn't it? The Trek is fighting talk. I mean that. Um, we'll call it nerves for being on, on, the, um, on the podcast. So, <laughs> Borg of Star Trek. Um, whereas, yes, obviously, that I said that that's why it, it, they've got a, a Borg edition of that yeah, as well. Sure. Um, which interestingly is why on the helm, on the um, yeah, the, 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 on the icon on your um, on your hoodie, yep, uh, why, <laughs> there it's, we go. why the seven of those handles rather than nine because the, the traditional helm was nine, the seven because of the um character on Star Trek. Ah, seven, of, seven nine. of nine. Ah, I never that's knew that. It's a, it's it's a yeah, it's a hidden 
reason they don't announce it as officially, but that's the reason why ah. you can't officially do that. But of course, the, yeah, the yeah. normal elms have um, have nine spokes on them and I have seven, and that's why. That's awesome. Excellent. <laughs> I love that little tidbit of information. That's great. That that was taken from one of Nigel's books, which is where I got that from. Awesome. So, uh, oh, yeah, that's excellent. Definitely, definitely buy them. Awesome. So final, final question then from me before we close out here. Um, yeah. If you were kind of revisiting the last few years where you've really embraced on this journey over the past four years or so, um, what couple of things would you say, I wish I knew that before I started out or things that, you know, people who are maybe starting on their journey or somewhere along that might help them along that you've learned along the way? Um, I think, well, personally, I think it would definitely be, um, if I can know something to start, then you now would be how to do the whole automation and DevOps pipeline and things like that from scratch mm -hmm. at the beginning. Now, I obviously have to learn that along the, along the way and um, kind of we spent a lot of time before going live as sure. a company, as a department, to, to make sure we, you know, we didn't just start supporting and get and figure it out along the way. Yeah. We spent a lot of time beforehand to, to try and learn this and obviously knowing about how all that worked before, having that time beforehand to get a bit ahead of that would have helped us as a company, I think, or, you know, it was how we, how we progressed at the beginning. Um, but in terms of things that help other people, things that I wish I'd known at the start, um, I would probably say there's, it's, it's probably not that much of a common misconception, but it, it can be a misconception that, um, because it's in public clouds, it's never going to go offline. Yes. Which a lot of people do think. And, yep. you know, that's not to say that, well, it's not the case because never say never. Yep. Um, not to say it will go offline, um, but you should never think that it, it, it will never go offline. And you definitely need to think about making sure that your deployments um, you know, are built to scale. So the cloud native technologies, they can do this automatically for you, take all that away, um, making sure things are set up HA. And, you know, you always hear the kind of the, the term being thrown around of cattle versus pets. Um, and, making sure that you should design things so that you design for failure, which seems to be quite extreme. And I think in Azure, you don't have to go quite as extreme as that, but you, sh you still should do, you know, you should, you shouldn't have some, you should, you should expect that any one thing can fail and you can stay online again. Um, and, you know, so I've seen people who we've, we've, we've brought online who, but uh, before they came to us, had a setup that they've done themselves because you know, anyone with a computer can build things. Um, and you know, all single instances. They're like, "This is really cheap. This is amazing." You're like, well, yes, but you've got one VM running yep. all these things, and where's the security? You've got public IP on that. There's no protection against layer like, seven attacks. There's no VPN. Mm -hmm. um, so they just think it's sometimes a silver bullet that's really cheap and will never fail. And in reality, it's um, it's it, it, you need to design it so it's for failure. And I guess on the cost side of things is knowing that. Because you can throw a few things into your calculator page and it looks cheap. It's it's if it's not cheap if you do it properly, it's not as cheap as what it can appear yeah. on there. And you quite often leave yourself open to all that risk without realizing yeah. because you can just spin things up to your kitchen table at home. You don't need those same experts or those same seasoned engineers with uh, kind of the battle scars of the past. And sometimes that can be that can be a little bit dangerous mm -hmm. if you if you're not fully aware of what you're doing. And the responsibility shifts onto you rather than onto someone else if you do it yourself. And you need to be fully aware of what that is. It's a, it's a great man once said, with great power comes great <laughs> responsibility. Uh, and that's very much the case as well. So that's something to be aware of. Excellent. No, great insights. Completely agree. Um, and I think a great way to wrap up a brilliant episode there. So, Matt, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Really appreciate it. Some great insights, great learnings from your journey over the past few years. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me, Chris. It's good to catch up with you again. So there we go, folks. Some brilliant, brilliant insights there from Matt and his journey over the past four years or so. So you know what to do. If you liked this episode, please go ahead, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you know as soon as there is brand new content. And of course, it's not just about YouTube. There is content on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and of course, cloudwithchris.com, where you can go and listen to the transcripts as well as read the, well, not listen to the transcript, listen to the recording, and read the transcript at the same time there as well. And of course, there's also the blog content available on cloudwithchris.com as well. 
So with that, thank you again for joining. Really appreciate the support. And until next week, folks, stay safe, stay healthy, and bye for now. <laughs>